Welcome to our Chapter 29, Part 1, Life in the 50s, or Happy Days. Uh, this one kind of focuses on suburban life in the 1950s. As the question you see posted um, kind of asks you to think about what can you tell me about this family without ever having seen this picture before, there's probably some things you could guess about this family. One, chances are the dad is a veteran of World War II. He'd served in some capacity. Um, two, that would mean he, that he had qualified for the GI Bill of Rights, uh, which enabled uh, veterans to receive low-interest loans for you know, buying houses or further the, furthering their college education. Uh, this family is probably a middle-class family that lives in the suburbs. Um, and the dad probably has a white-collar job, uh, meaning that he works you know, maybe some sort of office job or sales or something like that. And the, the wife is, uh, is probably a stay-at-home mom uh, who takes care of the kids, uh, drives them to where they need to be, um, and takes care of the home. Um, being that they live in the suburbs, they, they own at least one car to drive them around. And, and more than likely, um, and, and what happened more often than not was, you know, families were starting to own two cars. Um, so just by, you know, kind of looking at a picture, there's kind of some characteristics that we can kind of assume um, about the 1950s. As we had mentioned, that the, that family we saw probably lived in the suburbs, uh, which the suburbs during this time were growing at a rate of about 46%, and roughly one-third of the United States population did live uh, in the suburbs, actually. Um, one of the probably most kind of famous suburbs in America uh, became known as Levittown after William Levitt, who um, had taken some potato fields in Long Island and kind of converted them into a mass suburb where he kind of took the ideas of the assembly line that Ford had perfected to make cars and uh, brought that idea to the construction of homes. And they were able to put homes up very rapidly. Um, each home uh, kind of costing this, you know, back here in the 1950s, or actually 1948, the house of, uh, in Levittown would have cost about $7,000, which would work out to be about $60 a month. Now, these homes weren't anything that great necessarily. You know, 720 square feet, which is smaller than most, you know, single floors in the homes that we build today. And they were simple in the fact that they had probably two bedrooms and one bath. But in these suburbs, it really kind of uh, focused, life kind of focused on family, uh, community, uh, church, schools, and conformity. You know, there's only so many styles of homes. They all kind of look the same, and people came from the same socioeconomic background. In fact, the suburbs of the 50s probably looked a lot like the suburbs you might find today. In fact, the ones today are maybe even more impersonal as we put up our fences, and how many of us don't even know our neighbors' names, let alone really anything about them. Uh, there was this, uh, when it comes to economics, a uh, post-war boom in which many factors contributed to this uh, level of prosperity. Uh, but housing construction, um, sales of automobiles definitely helped spur on the economy during this time. Um, and even though things were prosperous, people were actually still running up quite a great deal of debt. In 1946, families had a debt of $8 billion. And by 1960, it had topped over $56 billion. Now, um, we know a little bit about the family roles already, um, but there, there really truly was this feeling of togetherness, both um, of families that would eat supper together and, and hang out together and you know, sit in the den and watch TV together. Um, much more so than probably what we see today. Um, but, you know, at the same time, back then, um, in 1950, uh, TVs 
uh, it existed in about 4 million households. And a short 10 years later, that increased to over 52 million TVs in our homes. And there was different programmings at different times of day, uh, which included comedies and adventures um, and kind of, uh, you know, we'll go over some of the other popular shows of the era in just a second here. Now you can see some of what those popular TV programs were, like um, I Love Lucy, Father Knows Best, The Lone Rangers, L Lone Ranger, and even Honeymooners. Um, other ones include like Mickey Mouse, uh, Bandstand, um, Gunsmoke, um, so a variety of type of shows, but uh, during the 1950s, uh, the average TV set was on for about six hours a day, and by the time um, you'd graduate from high school, you would have spent roughly 11,000 hours in school, but 15,000 hours in front of the TV. In fact, the chairman of the FCC, Newton Minnell, described the TV as a vast wasteland, a place where you know you sit um, mind-numbingly motionless um, with very little thought uh, in action kind of was the norm as you sat passively just kind of uh, really kind of wasting your time. And to think about how much time we spent in front of the TVs back then makes me wonder how much time do we spend in front of screens today uh, given the fact that here you are you know, studying for a lesson in front of a screen as well. How many times have your parents told you, you know, don't sit too close to the TV, put the remote control down, you know, no computer for you. Um, and you can imagine um, the different ways in which we, you know, use TV and computers today, how many hours we spend in front of them. Now, another characteristic of the time was obviously the baby boom. Uh, returning soldiers from World War II were ready to kind of settle down, get married, um, and there's this explosion of uh, babies, which you know obviously affects it, uh, affects America still today. After all, many of these baby boomers that were born in the 50s and 60s um, came, became you know uh, you know the hippies uh, later on, and you know they're the, uh, the generation that's retiring now. And people kind of wonder the effects of, you know, as we have an aging population, you know, and as they retire, how that affects our financial stability in America when it comes to things like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Um, but as these babies would grow older, the idea was that they were to be able to, you know, kind of conform and fit in at school and not cause any trouble. And if you couldn't behave at school, then how would you ever be successful in a job? So kind of the norm for these, you know, of teenagers of this era uh, would have been also to kind of uh, fit in and you know, kind of do what's expected and not talk back to the elders and, and kind of just uh, uh, behave and um, blend in with everybody else. Very little kind of individual um, styles, but more of a conformity.